Welcome to Topic 5, Budgeting, Principles, and Staffing. This is Dr. Hancock, and I'll be walking you through a brief overview of this week's content. The learner outcomes for Topic 5 are listed in your syllabus and on Canvas. This is what you'll accomplish by the end of the week. You'll describe the purpose and process of budgeting. You'll compare and contrast operating budgets versus capital budgets. You'll differentiate between variable and fixed costs. You'll demonstrate a working knowledge of staffing models and budgets. And you'll identify factors that increase employee-related expenses. I know that many healthcare professionals get queasy at the word budgeting. You may have had negative experiences in the past when the word budget was used to say no to something. You might feel anxious about what you'll be required to do this week. Relax. This is an introduction to budgeting. It's only meant to give you a brief glimpse into the world of budgets. It will be an easy ride, so you may as well take a deep breath and sail on in. What is a budget? In its simplest form, a budget is a financial plan for future activities. In my experience, one of the best ways to learn about budgeting is to start using a budget for your own household. Start by estimating your income and expenses every month, and then record what it is you actually earn and spend. I like to use a free software tool called Mint to track my income and expenses. For most of us, our biggest challenge is controlling costs or expenses. Once you've collected a few weeks or months of your information, you can start sorting your expenses into categories and then begin to analyze and evaluate your finances. Are you spending money on experiences and things that are important to you? If not, where can you make changes? You'll soon see that a budget is an incredibly helpful tool for making decisions and tracking your progress. Every business in healthcare or other markets needs a budget to help forecast revenues, which are sometimes called income, and expenses or costs. Budgets also have other purposes in an organization. The budget is used to make decisions, to establish priorities, and to set quantitative targets. It's also used to monitor and control business performance. A business budget typically progresses in phases that in total produce a complete budget life cycle. How long is the life cycle? It depends on the organization. A one-year budget is most common in healthcare agencies, but sometimes you'll see shorter or longer budget cycles. Regardless of its focus, the budget cycle begins with planning and ends with a thorough evaluation. Although the terms used to identify the four phases in the cycle may differ between businesses, the objectives of preparation, approval, implementation, and evaluation phases are generally the same. The budget cycle is just part of the overall strategic and financial management process. The preparation phase is where it starts. Budget preparation is a time-consuming process that typically takes from three to six months to complete for an annual budget. During this phase, managers will make plans, prioritize their spending, crunch numbers in different scenarios, and then develop a preliminary budget plan. Because most healthcare businesses prepare separate budgets for each department or division and then combine these later, Steps in the budget preparation phase may repeat themselves before creating a preliminary budget that's able to pass through approval. The budget preparation is usually done in one of two ways. Most large organizations will start with an existing historical budget and then they'll make changes to it. Other companies may start from scratch using what's called zero-based budgeting. You're not likely to see zero-based budgeting unless you're working on a new startup product, service, or business in healthcare. Historical-based budgeting is the norm. From preparation, you move into the approval phase. 
The length of the approval phase usually depends on the size of the business and its organizational structure. For example, budget approval responsibilities in a small business might involve only the owner or the owner and a few key managers. In contrast, medium and large sized businesses are characterized by a formal, hierarchical organizational structure and they typically assign approval responsibilities to boards, committees, or authorized senior level managers. Budget approvals often require a great deal of discussion and a consensus vote before the approval phase is done. From approval, you move into implementation. This is the doing or execution phase of the budget. And it most often runs from the beginning to the end of the calendar year or a fiscal year if that's how an organization does their tax returns. Regular consistent monitoring or accounting is critical to the implementation phase of the budget. This regular consistent reporting makes sure that departments are following their budgets, then they're maintaining internal controls. If adjustments become necessary during the year, parts of an annual budget may return to the preparation phase and go through the cycle again. If monitoring uncovers discrepancies, like big cost overruns, or spending that doesn't match the budget allocation, an internal audit could take place before the year's end. But more frequently, after the implementation phase begins the evaluation or auditing phase. The auditing phase consists of internal auditing, external auditing, or both, and it usually takes place after the year has ended. Thoroughly examining year-end financial reports and statements provide ways to assess whether the organization was compliant with budgetary constraints and to determine whether the projections or estimates that were used to create the budget were accurate. An evaluation report is created by an audit team, which includes recommendations for the coming year, and this completes both the audit phase or evaluation phase and the current year's budget cycle. We'll actually look at one of these audited financial statements a little bit later in the course. There are two primary budgeting types, an operating or operational budget and a capital budget. Your operating budget covers day-to-day -day expenses. This includes things like wages, rent, utilities, and purchases of items or supplies that are intended to last less than a year. A capital budget is for buying long-term assets. Assets are things like equipment and property that you expect to last for longer than one year. The budget for these purchases must come from the cash on hand to qualify as a capital budget expense. Nearly all businesses have a capital budget, so they continue to grow by purchasing assets that will produce income in the future. There are a few points about these budgets to note. If you borrow money for a capital expense, like a building, the actual expense comes out of your operational budget because you'll have to service that loan with monthly payments. Also, the cost of maintaining and repairing capital assets comes from operating budgets. Think of it like your house. The house is a capital asset. It should last longer than a year, but you have to use the money in your operating budget in order to pay your monthly mortgage note and to take care of any home repairs. Essentially, the operating budget tells you how much cash you need to take in every month to cover your planned expenses. If you're a departmental manager, you're more likely to have control over an operating budget. Capital budgets are usually controlled by high-level executives or business owners. In a budget, you'll see incoming money labeled as revenue or income and outgoing money labeled as expenses or costs. There are two major types of costs, fixed and variable. The difference between fixed and variable costs is that fixed costs do not change with activity volume, while variable costs are closely linked to activity volume. This fun illustration shows you what costs are fixed and what costs are variable in something as simple as a lemonade stand. In your personal budget, a fixed cost might be your car payment, if you have one, 
while your fuel costs will be variable. Your car payment stays the same each month, regardless of how much you drive. However, the fuel costs can vary greatly based upon how many miles you drive or your usage. Last week, you took a quick look at fixed and variable costs when you did the break-even analysis. In every healthcare business, there are some fixed costs and some variable costs. Examples of fixed costs could include things like rent, buildings, machinery, and insurance policies. Examples of variable costs might include employee labor and supplies. When a cost contains elements of both fixed and variable costs, it's considered to be a mixed cost. Because healthcare is a service industry, employment expenses tend to be a large percentage of total expenses. If there is a minimum staffing level that's required, that would be a fixed cost. The CEO's salary, for example, is a fixed cost. However, if staffing varies with the patient or the service volume, then it's a variable cost. For example, if a unit clerk's shift is canceled because of low patient census, then the hospital is trying to manage variable costs. The notion of fixed and variable costs usually applies within a budget cycle. When you think about the very long run, say 10 or 20 years, all costs are variable because you can always get rid of the things that create fixed costs for you if you have a long enough time frame. So far, so good, right? Let's hike right along. Your reading assignments go into substantial detail about staffing budgets. I am not going to ask you to create a detailed staffing budget or to calculate full-time employees, FTEs, from scratch. What I do want you to know are some staffing-specific budget principles. In larger healthcare systems like hospitals, staffing is usually budgeted to a specific department, which might be called a unit or a cost center. For example, in a hospital, the emergency department might be one cost center, while the operating room is another cost center. Each unit or cost center has specific staffing needs, and the manager is responsible for filling that unit with a variety of healthcare staff in order to meet the patient needs while staying within the budgeted expense amount. The trick is to determine the best mix of healthcare staff to keep your costs low while making sure that you also have the right people available with the right skills to meet your needs. We'll talk about building a staffing model in a minute, but first, some key terms to know. Terms are so important in this topic that I've included a learning activity for you that is just a list of terms. Please make sure you understand each one. If your reading assignment and my overview are not sufficient, use Google or another search engine, but go find a source that explains the terms in language that makes sense for you. One unique term for staffing is the FTE, or full-time equivalent. This is a concept that represents one person working in a full-time position, and it's used to calculate staffing costs. Generally, an FTE is worth 2,080 hours of paid work in most organizations. However, sometimes a business or unit has their own definition of FTE, so you always need to ask questions to find out the standard practice if you are the one responsible for your department's budget. Two other key terms to note are the principles of productive versus non-productive time. Productive time is defined as the time that an employee spends performing a job or task. In healthcare, the productive time of a nurse, for example, would be the time spent in planning and providing patient care. Non-productive time is the time an employee spends doing things that are not associated with that perform performing the job or task. In healthcare, there can be a lot of mandatory non-productive time for employees. The nurse in our example might have a lengthy orientation period, several days of continuing education on the job, and be required to participate in staff meetings. Those all take the nurse away from patient care and therefore are non-productive time. 
Non-productive time also includes paid time off, like vacation, holidays, and sick days. Most organizations have a standard formula for calculating non-productive time in each job category, so you're rarely going to have to calculate this. Instead, you're more likely to use your organization's preset formulas as you prepare your staffing budget. So how do you build a staffing model? Most of the time, you're going to have historical data to start with, but if not, you can use a model based on your business estimate and industry data. Things like, how many patient beds will you have? What's your estimated census? How many services will you provide? That's the kind of data you start with. The next step is to determine your staffing mix. What type of workers do you need to provide the service? How many of each type of worker? There are legal and regulatory requirements that you may need to be aware of as well as the best evidence available from research. If you're working in the state of Mississippi, staffing requirements are regulated for long-term care facilities and other agencies by something called the Certificate of Need or CON program. I've posted more information for you about this program in Canvas. You'll factor in productive and non-productive time to determine the number of FTEs you need in each job category. From there, you'll calculate the financial impact. How much will this staffing mix cost? What resources do you have available to fill the FTEs? Do you need to hire full-time employees or part-time employees or a combination? Will there be overtime or call time? Do you have access to a flexible PRN or float staff? Will you need to hire temporary or travel agency staff? And how will those choices affect your total employee-related expense? The decisions you make about staffing will have a great impact on the expenses of the unit cost center and then ultimately the budget and the financial performance of the organization. So, those are some key principles in budgeting and staffing. Where do you go from here? First, read the assigned chapters in your textbook and review the websites that I've posted on Canvas. Work through the key terms in your learning activities and be sure you understand them. Your discussion assignment for the week is related to a staffing challenge. Be sure to post your original answer by Wednesday and then reply to peers by Sunday night. You'll also, for your practice exercise, prepare a simple budget using an Excel spreadsheet, and then you'll answer a few questions about that budget. Be sure to save your work on the budget because you'll revisit it in Topic 6 when we discuss budget variances. That's it. You can do it. Have a great week.